All right. Yes, sir. I was just, I wasn't sure if this was cracked, good, okay. Right you're okay. okay. Yeah. If I don't say redo or anything, you're fine. Real quick, um, <laughs> a little bit later I'm going to be referencing this guy. Remember this handout from a while back? Does everybody have that dude? Yeah. There you go. Yay. Do what now? Uh, what's up? So you can break oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> This year? Yeah. You need one? I need one. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. This is chapter four, right? The probability of one, right? Chapter four. Yes. Okay, but you haven't got the uh, chapter three. Okay. That's fine. It's fine. Yeah. 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 He's having great ideas. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. It's just the way it always works. But if you turn in homework before the day of the review, you always get it back by that review day. Uh, so it's not a bad idea to do it that way. Uh, any questions from homework stuff, or has it been way too long? I'm just glad we all found the room again. Remember, this is statistics, right? Good? Feels like a long time. Okay. All right, so no questions on our homework. All right, so I, I want to kind of catch up to where we were last time. Um, I'm going to make section 6.6 six extra credit. If you're online, it's already up there as extra credit. I'm going to talk about it very quickly, but... Say again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... I'll talk about it really briefly here in a little bit. 6.4 and 6.5. 6.4 is the one that most of you are going to freak out about. That's just the way it is. Uh, we had that handout. They got a lot of examples in the book. In fact, they actually use the exact same set of data you're supposed to use for the problems I gave you. So they've already got it broken up into samples for you. Uh, but still, it's freaky. So I don't blame you too much for being freaked out about it. Um, there's no questions on it, so great. We'll move on. 6.4 kind of built up into 6.5. 6.4 explained why it works the way it does, and 6.5 is the actual what the hell you do with this stuff. Um, and it's all about this thing called the central... Central limit theorem, which I'm going to refer to as the CLT. Not chicken, lettuce, tomato. <laughs> Depending on how hungry you are, it doesn't matter. And what this means is, what happens when I take bigger and bigger samples? Like, you remember the idea with Florida. If I just talk to individuals, they could be anywhere aged, who knows? But when I start taking samples of 20, samples of 50, samples of 100, what happens to the picture? What's a real quick way to summarize that for me? What happens to the distribution of stuff of ages? Yeah, and where's it? Where's it? What happens to standard deviation? Gets smushed in, smushed towards what? The center being the the, the mean. Good. So, in the limit that my sample sizes get very large, they will go towards the center. 
And that's one reason why it's called a central limit theorem. Kind of makes sense. As my samples get really, really big, they're all going to come to the middle. And in fact, if I took every damn person in Florida, if my sample size was Florida, <laughs> and I plotted that, it would be right on the mean. I mean, that would you, right? There would be no deviation. It would be the mean of Florida would be the answer. So this is kind of like the limit. It's going to be the, the center of it will be the limit. All right. Maybe. So what this says is, as n gets larger, you guys knew I was going to put there. I won't. As n gets larger, the sampling distribution, good lord, becomes more normal. Obviously, if it starts off normal, the sampling distributions of that normal population will all already be normal. Let me say that again. If your distribution starts off normal, I don't care how big your sample is, it's going to look normal at the end. If you're taking it from an already normal population, your sampling distribution is still going to look normal. But here's the beauty of this. It says no matter how ugly, it gets a little bit more specific, thankfully. It's kind of vague. For n, I think the book says greater, it depends on the book, greater than or equal to 30. So if I take samples of size 30, then the sampling distribution will be normal enough. Why is that an important thing to know? If I know it's normal enough, what do I mean that uh, enough? What does that mean? When I say normal enough to do what? Like, we don't know what you want, dude, man. It's been a week. <laughs> What's, what's the strongest, beefiest thing we have to deal with probabilities for normal distributions? What, what can I use? Is there any probabilities we don't know for a normal distribution? We know all of them, don't we? Why? What do we use? Z-score -score chart. And you can only use it if it's normal enough. So that's what I mean. When I say normal enough, I mean normal enough to use that chart. That chart only works if it's a normal distribution. Thank God it doesn't have to be exactly normal. It just has to be normal enough. Cool. All right. Maybe I've said that enough. We'll see. All right. So for samples greater than 30, I was taught at least 30. I think the book says greater than 30. It doesn't really matter. For sample, 30 is a magic number. The sampling distribution will be normal enough, period. I don't care what it started off looking at. So for n greater than 30, the sampling distribution will be normal enough. Let me put in parentheses to use z score chart. So a bigger kind of idea here is z-scores don't correspond directly to exact probabilities. Oh, let me say that again. It's already a long sentence. <laughs> z-scores do not correspond directly to exact probabilities unless I know, for example, it's normal. If I know it's normal distribution, I know what the, the probabilities are. I can just look at the chart, right? But if I don't know if it's normal, I can't say any probabilities. I can use Chebyshev's theorem, but why does Chebyshev's theorem sort of suck? Yeah, and Chevy says it's not exact. It's at least this, at least that. That's not good enough. I need to know, is it 75% or is it 99%? That's kind of a big difference, <laughs> right? 75%, 99%, that's one of those chances you'll live the surgery. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> well, let's, let's pin that down, right? Okay. And finally, it says very specifically, the mean of all the sample means is the same as the original mean, right? And the new standard deviation will, of course, be smaller now because, like you guys told me, it rushes to the middle. So it's going to be less spread out. Let me try to make this point really big right now. If, uh, let me see, how do I make this point? What, is, what the hell is this? I keep talking about this, and this is the key thing. That is what this is true for. What the hell is that? What is this? The whiteboard. No. <laughs> this phrase, 
sampling distribution. Remember what I did when I was at Ford. I said uh, the first picture I had was when I talked to individuals and I plotted this. It's because I said, how old are you, sir? 97. How old are you, sir? You're two, right? He said, you called me sir. Yeah, sure did. <laughs> so those are individuals. You with me? So I don't care how big. I mean, this is a big ass sample. Let's say we're talking about, I have no idea how big Florida is, to be honest. We'll say there's 12 million people in this alternate universe floor. That's a lot of people. So does this statement have a damn thing to do with that? I mean, is that normal? That's bigger than 30. But that's because this is a picture of individuals. This doesn't talk about what the picture of individuals looks like. This talks about if I take samples of uh, size. So this is for individuals. So you can sort of be really technical and say this is samples of size one, right? Like being a, a, a wolf pack of one or an army of one. <laughs> kind of silly to say that. It sounds kind of stupid, right? That's why I was on the movie The Hangover, for example. <laughs> uh, but now if I say, okay, let me take samples of size 50 and let me plot all the averages for all the samples of size 50. Do you understand the difference? It's not a single sample. The sampling distribution is all the freaking samples of size 50. If I plot those, this guarantees is going to look something like that. <clears throat> and again, I'm hoping that what we went through when I talked about section 6.4 explains why it's going to look like that. The most likely thing, if I take 50 people randomly, the most likely thing is to get a mixture, and so that's why the middle is so tall. The least likely thing is to get a bunch of really young people or a bunch of really old people. That's why the outside is so small. You put those two things together and you get something that should be roughly bell-shaped. And this theorem says, actually, it is bell-shaped. Enough. All right. So we've seen samples bigger than 30 that were nowhere near normal. That is not what this, this is, does not suddenly change all the math we've done before. That never can happen. This says if you look at the picture of all samples of size more than 30, then that will become normal enough. I'm so happy to be back. So let's do a, that's enough theory for right now. Let's do a concrete example to remind ourselves how the hell this works. And then we're going to try to finish off chapter six. So let me ask you this question. So the mean tire pressure for all tires is known to be 32. Uh, actually, let me add one thing on there, too. Standard deviation of the population, sigma, is, uh, let's say, 3.98. So let me stop there for a second. So we know this is true for all tires, all certain type of tires, 32 PSI. Standard deviation of the population is 3.98. We take a sample of 60 tires. Um, before doing probabilities, do we, uh, are we allowed to use the z-score chart? Why? Why 
are we allowed to use the z-score chart? Why are we allowed to use the z-score chart? Yeah. Yeah, so if I'm talking about, I'm going to ask probabilities of the sample of 60 tires, like the probability that the sample has an average more than 33 or something, I'm totally allowed to use the z-score chart because the sample size is at least 30. It's, it's 60. So what's really going on in the background is there exists for all 60s, for all samples of 60, I could possibly collect all samples of 60. I don't have a clue what the distribution looks like for tires, period. It could look like the freakiest thing in the world. Uh, this is not the freakiest thing in the world, but it could look like that. Right? I have no idea what it looks like. But if I plot all possible samples of size 60 and take their mean, if I plot those means, it will come out to look like that. And so if I ask you a question, so this is check, n greater than 30, central limit theorem says yes. That's desperately trying to be the letter C. There it goes. So if I ask you, what's the probability that our sample mean is more than 33? What I'm asking then is, here's the picture of all samples of size 60. That's the picture of all samples of size 60. What's going to be in the middle of it? 32 totally, of course. Just because I'm taking 60 tires at a time instead of one, they're still going to have the same freaking average, right? Does that make sense? You take 60 tires at a time instead of one at a time, you get the average. It's still going to be the same freaking average. That's the part where it says mu x equals mu. The mean stays the same. So this will be 32. So really my question is, here's my sample of 60 tires. I want to know what's, what's probably is greater than 33. So what's probably my sample falls somewhere in that area? That's the question. So again, remember the trigger I told you. How do I know when to change the standard deviation? Two things. When we take a sample and I ask you about the sample mean. When you see those two things happening, you know you've got to change the standard deviation. Why? Because the picture now is going to be skinnier. The standard deviation now must change. What's the standard deviation good for? Absolutely no. <laughs> I'll tell you what it's good for, Jeff. What, what's that? That's a weird question. No. That's good for individual tires. So that's like the old, that's like the stuff we did in section 6.3, which I'm now going to call old, even though it's still relatively new. Uh, where I said we pick one tire, what's the probability it's more than 32? Why couldn't I do that problem now? If I picked one tire and I want to know the probability that the one tire is more than 33, why can't I do that problem? What is it that tells me I can do this problem? Why, why were we allowed to use the C-score chart? Sample is bigger than 30, right? If I'm talking about one tire, Shit, I don't know if this is normally distributed. It could look like that freakiness, right? So I couldn't even answer that question. But since I took a sample of at least 30, I know that that new picture that has all the means on it, that will now be normally distributed. So I can say, where would this fall most likely in the middle? So what's the probability it's more than 33, that it's that far away from the mean? What's the first thing I have to do before I calculate that? Change the standard deviation, right? And it's still a population standard deviation. I desperately want you, I'm not changing it into a sample standard deviation. This is the standard deviation for individuals. If I divide it by the square root of n, it's now the standard deviation for groups of size 60 in this case. But it's still the population of all those possible samples of size 60. So in a nuts and bolts level, this is exactly the same work you do in section 6.3. The only new thing is this. There's one little tweak you've got to make. Don't use that number. Use what you're going to get now. What do you get when you divide the old standard deviation by the square root of 60? So 0 0.5. 0.5. I want four. Cool. All right. Cool. And then 
now, now it's just like old times, right? Which still, it really isn't old times. I'm just going to pretend like it is. So here's my picture. I've already got my picture made. Here's my middle. Here's my X bar. So now, how do I make a Z-score? What goes on the bottom? Yeah, the correct standard deviation, which in this case is 0.514. Yeah, my, my point that I'm interested in, 33, minus the mean. And what's the mean known to be? 32. So this is a sample mean minus the mean of all sample means. It's all, it actually, the z-score formula never changes. It's the date, the point I'm interested in minus what I know the middle to be, always. It never changes. One point nine something. One point nine five. Five. It's like one point nine four six or something. Right. Does that feel familiar? I mean, if you're doing your homework. I know it might be a little while since we did anything. I, I don't blame you for that. Right, we all needed that break desperately. I can relate to that. But again, I need that section 6.3 to be just second nature, just really simple. All you got to do, they ask you a question, you make a z-score out of the, what they ask you about, and then you look it up. Now, when you look this up with a chart, is it going to be the answer? No, because the chart's always going to tell me the area below. So when I look up 1.95 in the chart, what do you get? Nine seven four four. Point nine. And so my actual answer is going to be two, five, six. It's like two and a half percent chance, roughly, that you would pick a sample of sixty tires that had uh, a pressure more than thirty three. Yes, sir. You're good. So would you say it would be unusual? to get a sample of 60 tires that had a pressure more than 33. Yes or no? Yes, right? And I'm kind of relating this back to the, the horrible Super Bowl incident, but if I was trying to check, if somebody made a claim and they said, no, all our tires are pumped to the correct pressure, and I took a sample of 60 tires from their lot, and I found that it had more than, they had a higher than 33 average pressure, that's, Higher than X, that's unusually high. <laughs> Sorry. So I would say to them, no, 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 your claim is wrong. You're wrong. This is evidence that they're wrong. What's the chance that I'm wrong? That they're actually right? Two and a half percent chance that I'm wrong. And I can and that's pretty damn good for me. So I, I'm okay with that. So that's where we're headed soon, is to use this as evidence against or for something. Right? I can actually test a claim somebody makes by taking a sample and saying, you're full of shit, or uh, I can't say you're full of shit yet, but I'll keep trying. That's really what we do. Maybe not in those same terms. All right, let's do another one. All right, some of you guys are like, yes, let's do it. Okay. So I want, I'll, let's do one that is very close to one I would give you on a test, because that's really going to get you guys to, to pay attention. <laughs> if I say that, we'll see if I'm telling the truth. So we got this here? Okay. So they'll do this in the book too. So let's just make a problem real quick. Let's say we have a normal distribution. All right, so I know it's normally distributed, right? So what's my sample size got to be? At least... I know it's normal. I already know it's normal. So my sample size has to be one. One's fine. Why is one okay? Because it's already normal. Good, right? So the central limit theorem says no matter what it looks like, once you hit 30, it's normal enough. If it's already freaking normal, though, it's freaking normal. You're only making it even more normal when you're taking, so you only need a sample of one. So on this kind of question I can ask, uh, so let's say we have a normal distribution. So the mean is uh, 
And the standard deviation is, uh, what sounds good, Jeff? I don't know, 4.26. Screw trying to come up with the back story. Let's just get to the numbers. <laughs> All right, so that can mean whatever you want them to mean. All right. Um, part A would say we pick one uh, whatever unit. Let's say grapefruit. We pick one grapefruit. This is the acidity of the grapefruit. Right. Measure it. I don't know what units. We pick one thing. It doesn't matter what it is. You guys got it with me? I got to try not to be so... I want to make sure you guys are cool with this. We pick one whatever the hell it is. All right. uh, what's the probability that it has an acidity uh, less than uh, what What you want, Jeff? 41. Am I allowed to make z-scores and look it up in the chart? Am I allowed to do that? Yes, why? It's normal. Do I have to change the standard deviation? No, because the two things didn't happen. Did I take a sample? No, I'm just taking one thing. I'm not taking a sample of things. Then am I talking about the sample mean? Well, how would I be talking about sample mean if I'm not taking a sample? That wouldn't make any sense, right? So those two things have to happen in order for you to change the standard. In fact, if you if you did this, you would be divided by the square root of one because you're taking one, which it, it would stay the same. Holy shit, you'd be fine. That's what I'm trying to say, right? So this formula is actually always true. Take one thing, it's the same damn thing. So what's my picture look like? What's gonna be right in the middle? 49.7. I drew it as a bell curve because I know it's normal. You can make a triangle, whatever the hell makes it so you have something to look at, some, some anchor on your paper to refer to. Uh, 41, where's that? Yeah, down there. And I want to know less than, that's nice. So you guys finish that out. Oh. Does anybody still need uh, like their own z sport chart? Make sure it's got two sides to it. How do you set up the z-score? What's it going to be? 41 minus 49.7 over 4.26. I like it. I want that formula just to become part of your person, just to become part of you. Sounds weird. It's like a whole Cronenberg movie, but oh well. What do you guys get when you do that? So I got two votes for 2.04 negative? Yes. I got more than that. Okay, good. All right. So double check if you didn't get that. It's a protest march outside. <laughs> so negative protest and statistics. So of course, when you look that up, what's going to be nice about that? When you look it up, you have the answer. The answer. It kicks ass. Because they were asking about below. When I look it up, I get the area below. When you look at negative 2.04, what area do you get? 0207? Yes. So, 2% out there, right? <coughs> so, picking one grapefruit, you have a less, you have a uh, just around a 2% chance of having acidity less than 41. <coughs> I guess I did make a backstory to this. So, um, so if I take eight grapefruit, should it be easier or harder to get them to have an acidity less than 41 for them to be out here? Harder, right? It's sort of like me asking, go out and pick somebody at random. You get somebody uh, seven foot tall, let's make it a little more, six foot tall. And then go out and take 10 people at random and their average height is six feet tall. That's going to have a much smaller probability of happening. It's much harder to do that, isn't it? If it's truly random sampling. And that 
the idea of that is everything shifts to the inside. Everything is going to become skinnier. So there's going to be less stuff out here in the tail. Visually, that's what's happening. There's less stuff in the tail. That's going to have a smaller area now. So what's the first thing I got to do if I pick 10 grapefruit? Because I think this plural grapefruit is grapefruit, I think. Moose and meese. <laughs> 10 grapefruit. What's well, probably that the average of those 10 is less than 41. So there's your triggers happening, right? I took a sample of 10. I'm asking about the average of that 10. Therefore, I have to do what? Change the standard deviation. All right, do it. Try to finish that up. You already know the answer is going to be less than 0.02. It should be. So what do you guys get for the new standard deviation? One point three four seven. Yes. All right, but at least three places. And so the Z it's gonna be the sec you can draw the picture the same. We know it's gonna be skinnier, but you don't have to be all specific when you draw the picture. Blah, blah, blah. So Z score is gonna be the exact same formula except Use that value because that's what's good for groups of size 10. Right? That one's good for groups of size 1. And what Z score do you get? Negative 6.4. Gas. Would you say that's kind of far away? I was way the hell down there. Now, the, the chart, what's the chart tell you about that? Chart, of course, is full of shit in this case, but we'll see. What's the chart say about it? I, I like it. So I agree with the chart. When you're at negative 3.5, there is 0 0.0001 below that, but we're like twice as far down. There's not still 0 0.0001 below that. There's now 0 0.0000001 or something silly. So I'd say if it's off the chart, Right? And again, notice how slowly I started talking. It's a big note to take. If it's off the chart, it's approximately 0% or 100% if I got positive 3.5, right? It'd be like 100% below. So this, I'd say the answer for this, that's just so far down, is approximately 0%. Or the book would call this 0 plus, for example, right? Good old 0 plus, remember that? If you don't, you haven't done the homework yet, so you probably don't want to admit that. All right, good. No one not to nod. Okay. And why does that make sense? Why does it make sense it's smaller than this was? Yeah, because everything kind of went to the middle. That left very little out here. In fact, that left approximately nothing out here. Once I take 10 grapefruit, it should be right in the middle. Now, now think about this. If this number was something that told me the health of my grapefruit, like I'm worried my soil is getting depleted too much, or there hasn't been enough rain, or something's wrong with the water, or something. You with me? And I go out and I take one grapefruit. That might not be enough evidence to somebody. Look at this bad grapefruit. Okay, one grapefruit's bad. But I take 10 grapefruit, and they have less than 41, whatever this 41 means, we've got a health of the soil or something, that would be humongous evidence that something bad is going on. That's just so unlikely to happen. 
just at random to have 10 grapefruit that have less than 41, the probability of that is basically 0%. And if you go do it then, you go do it. Something that's almost impossible, you go do it, you're like, my assumption that is the soil is good must be wrong. The soil must be bad. That's more likely than, or the water's bad, or something's wrong. This is bad. You guys kind of with me here? This is where we're headed. I'm going to keep putting in that those terms because chapter 8 is going to be all about investigating claims. Okay, cool. All right, hopeful. Okay, cool. All right. So 6-6 six, six is extra credit. I'm going to get into 6-7 if there's no questions on this. So the better you guys are with 6-2 and 6-3... The easier this is going to be because it's just knowing when to do this. Very little changes. That's awesome. Yeah. And just to let you know, Journal articles, Gallup, all those things, they use processes very similar to this to show evidence of something. So when they have a psychological study where they take 500 people and they say, uh, did you know, when, I always go back to when you were toilet trained, but I don't, um, you know, you ask them some kind of question, uh, did you play with fire when you were young or something, right? And they take percentages. They, they can figure out, uh, well, amongst the people that did that, then they had a, such a low probability that we had them, that we picked them, and they became serial killers or something later. This is horrible, but oh well. I mean, it shows evidence. It's so unlikely that they would just happen to have it, that that thing must be affecting that, that, that uh, uh, the, the, the fact that they set fires when they were small or the fact that they didn't live with their mom or whatever, right? It had an effect on it because the probability got so low that it would happen by chance that it must be that thing you were looking at, that they didn't live with their mom or whatever was going on. Okay, maybe, 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 maybe. So 6-7 is what I was trying to get us ready for with this um, handout. I think it's the overhead that doesn't go on both screens, right? That's true. So I don't know if you guys remember this, but uh, let me ask you this. Let's say I make 1% uh, of my free throws, right? Like, even Shaquille O'Neal feels good standing next to me. <laughs> Poor guy, he's retired. Gotta pick somebody else to pick on. Um, and I take, if I take 40 free throws, how many free throws would you expect me to make? What's the average number of free throws I should make? How do you figure that out? Who remembers that beautiful formula for this? <laughs> I've given you all the information you need. What percentage of free throws do I make? 1%, and I take 40 free throws, so how many would you expect me to make? How do you do that? You would take 1% of 40. And what's 1% of 40? 4. Point 0.4. All right, so mu is NP. Remember that little dude? Yeah. Right. So this is 40. That's 0.01, so I get 0.4. Which is basically what I would call zero, right? Maybe every now and again I'll make one out of 40. And that's why it's, it's not zero. But what, if I try to draw this, the highest peak should be close to this. So it'll be here's zero, and then one is going to be way the hell down there. Is that, does that have any chance to be normal? Does that look normal at all? So in order to be normal, and if I made too many free throws... If n was 40 and p was 0.99, I make 99% of my free throws, right? So even, even uh, Steve Nash is, is, is jealous of me, right? Like, Steve, don't be jealous. I only took two free throws. Um, if I take 40 free throws and this is true, how many would you expect me to make on average? Uh, 
the risk, if this is 0.4, that's gonna be 39.6. Do you see how that works? It's kind of interesting. If you multiply them out, sure enough, you get 39.6. Now, if I try to draw that, I really, really want you to understand. If I take 40 free throws, what's the most free throws I can make? What's the most free throws anybody can make, theoretically? If I take 40 free throws, I can make 40. If you make more than that, come see me. <laughs> the ball just jumps out of your hand. I don't know, All right? So, so I really want you to understand, there's a wall here because I can't go below zero. So if my mean is too small, it all stacks up against that wall. There's a wall on the other side too. I can't go above 40. So if my mean is too high, it all stacks up against that wall. Does that look normal? So in order to be normal for a binomial distribution, in order for it to be normal, the mean's got to be somewhere in the middle. Not just the mean of the successes, but the mean of the failures too. So both, so, so NP and NQ, I don't know if you guys remember this, have to both be greater than, I think the book says or equal to, five. If it's greater than five, it'll be out here. So it's got room to go up and come back down. Does that make sense? In order to look normal, it's gotta have room to go up and then come back down. And it can't be up against that wall, and that's what this other guy says. The other side can't be too close to that wall. It's got to be pushed out by at least five. And then it's got room to come back down. Maybe, maybe. So this, I really hope you understand. So, so in section 6.5 and 6.4, we learned for central limit theorem, for central limit theorem, for continuous variables, for stuff like weights and so forth, uh, and it's got to be at least 30. Right? So we just figured out that we just learned for central limit theorem for continuous variables, n's got to be at least 30. This is for binomial. What's the difference with binomial data? If I take 40 free throws, can I make 1.8 of them? What would that mean? It rolled around the rim so much and then fell outside, you're like, oh, we're still going to count it. Or I made it, or it was so ugly, they're like, we'll give you 0.8 for that one. No, it either went in or it didn't go in, right? So what kind of data would this be? Not continuous. Discrete. Shit. So for a binomial to be normal, for a binomial to be normal enough, this has got to be true. You with me? For a binomial situation to be normal enough, this must be true. This is the check you make. For continuous, this must be true. When you're taking samples and talking about the sample, I mean, this has got to be true. It's, your sample's got to be at least 30 bit. Everybody always confuses those, and I can't really blame you too much because there's a very fine line between them. But I only use this if I actually have N and P. That kind of makes sense. Right? So that would be a binomial situation. They give me, I do this, and, I, and the probability of success is this. That's binomial. Because then I know what Q is. Kind of with me. And this one is going to be the normal setup. The mean is this, and the standard deviation is this. That's the normal setup. That's the z-score normal kind of thing. All right, maybe, 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 maybe. So, I want to show you the whole point of section 6-7. And really, one of the most important things, but not the only important thing, is this to come out of there. That's the, very important. Why is that so important? Because in statistics, if I can say it's normal enough, I know every damn thing about it. I got the whole chart to look at. I know everything about it. If I can't say it's normal enough, I basically don't know shit. So that's a very important hurdle to jump over, right? If I can say it's normal enough, cool. But in order to say it's normal enough, I have to have a way to check it. There's a way to check the binomial to see if it's normal enough. So this dude here, that looked normal enough to us, right? Remember this? That certainly looks normal enough, doesn't it? How do we check it? Though? What's the check I can do to see if that's normal enough? What can I check? What's the test to see if it's normal enough for a, for a binomial situation? Yeah, check this, right? The thing I made a big deal out of. Oh, you guys are like, it's too obvious. I'm not going to say shit. It's right there in front of us. 
Or if you didn't really know, then I'm going to start to cry, but it's all right. These things happen. It's this. It's the test to see if it's normal enough for a binomial. So this problem, what was N? 14. What was P? 25. Because it's 50 50 for, a head, for a heads and tails. Right. So what's the NP? Half of 14 is? Which is bigger than or equal to? 5. NQ would be also 7. So I get an average of 7 heads. Successes, average of seven tails, failures, right? And that's also at least five. Therefore, this thing is normal enough. Now, just hang with me now. I'm going to go into some more concrete stuff right now. This has all been kind of theoretical stuff. But here's what a problem would look like. So, uh, we calculated this, if I remember correctly, last time from the picture. So, you got what this number here was. The probability most six. Three nine five sounds familiar. Okay, cool. Summation to the binomial. I sound like I'm giving some kind of weird political speech. I call this the NAB, right? The normal approximation to the binomial. NAB. So on the test, if I say use the NAB, you're going to do exactly what we're about to do. Okay. So I verified that this problem is considered normal enough. Now the problem, z scores are built off of what kind of data? Not this kind of data. It's not built off of discrete data. It's built off of continuous data, right? Let me say that again. Z-scores are built off of, when I look at the normal distribution, that's a continuous set of data, continuous. So it could be weights, it could be heights, something, something that's continuous, it doesn't skip. But if I'm talking about flipping a coin, like I said earlier, can I get 1.8 heads? No, I get zero or one, or two. Does that make sense by itself? Okay, cool. All right, so you guys are okay. I think you're just bored to tears. You're, you, I think some of you guys are understanding. <laughs> I like that, somebody's like, I'm just gonna tell you, yes. All right, thanks for that. Um, so what's going on here is zero. No, it's not that high. One, two, blah, 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 three. Those are discrete, but when I draw that box over top of them, I'm doing something that's actually exactly what this theory needs to work. I need to pretend like this data is continuous. It's discrete because there really is gaps between one and two. There's this huge gap, but look what I just did. Are there gaps now in between any data points? No. And that's because one isn't really one. One is from what to what? You remember this from our boundaries versus limits days, right? What is it? 0. 0.5 to 1.5. And two goes up to 2.5. And three goes up to 3.5. Okay, maybe, maybe. So what happens is, just like the centered limit theorem requires you to make a tweak. It requires you to take the standard deviation and change it. Because that's good for individuals to begin with. You've got to make it work for groups of size, whatever the hell you're working with. This is going to require you to say, oh shit, I can't use 0, 1, 2, 6, right? The question there is at most 6. I have to use the adjusted number. So at most 6, somebody help me out. Somebody put 6 up here. There's 7. Jeff, yeah, you're good. There's 7. <laughs> 5, 6, and then 7 was the tallest. Makes sense? So at most 6... Do you want to include six? Yes. yes, of course. At most six, you want to include. If you can't have most six people in the elevator, you're not going to freak if there's a sixth person. You're going to say, yeah, come on in. But the seventh person, no. <laughs> go, go away. Right? You kick them because you want to live. Um, 
So at most six, I really want you to understand this. I have to say that that's either 5.5 or 6.5. This is the whole idea here. What this is called, what I'm about to do, it's called a continuity correction. Because this data, is this data continuous data? No. Normal things try to use, have to use continuous data. So I have to correct this to be continuous. And how do I correct it to be continuous? How did we do it way back when we first did histograms? We go up and down by half. So they really touch, they're not gaps in the, mid, in the middle. That kind of kicks ass. That's a very simple thing. So now here's the thing. If I want to shade, if I want, at most six, I'm going to shade from down here up to something. If I stop at five and a half, did I, does that sound good? I want to include six, right? So I actually, to include the bar that defines six, I have to go up to six and a half. Now, just like it did for section six, five, took me forever to explain this. A lot of you guys are still lost, but the beauty of this is, it's one stupid thing you gotta do. Don't use the number they give you, change it by a half. How do you know if you go up or down? Take a second and think about it, right? Don't try to memorize this shit, just think about it. I wanna include six, so I better not stop there, I better go up there, bam, bam. go to 6.5. Not a huge deal to think about how to change it. So now when I go to make my Z-score, I don't use six. 6.5. So the whole idea of the NAV is not that you got to change the standard deviation, is that you got to change the number you're working with. Because that number that was originally six, that's discrete data. Shit, I got to correct for that not being continuous. So 6.5, what was the mean? Seven, right? And who's got the standard deviation? There's something we calculated up here. One point eight seven one. Okay, you guys kind of with me here? Just to make this point, you do not have to change the standard deviation because I'm not taking the sample. I'm not asking about sample means, right? None of that is happening. Another thing is, I only ever do one tweak at a time, right? One tweak at a time. So either I tweak this dude or I tweak that dude, right? Or I tweak him. What do you get when you do that Z score? Stay with me now, I want, I want to get there. We're gonna to get to that number. What do we get? Negative point two seven? Two six. Two six seven, so two seven, cool. So look that up in the chart. Negative point two seven. was 0.27 negative. So you get what now? 0.3? 3.9? 36. Right? Right? Right. Yes. And remember, what was the actual value we got for the bi using the binomial approach? 0.395, right? Well, we did this earlier. We actually calculated this, and we calculated just by adding up all these probabilities up to 6. We got 0.395 here. So why is it not the exact same number? This is what we got from binomial, and this is what we got from the normal, well the key is, it's a freaking approximation, right? We shifted it by half and we're using something that's continuous that isn't really continuous. I shouldn't expect it to come out to be the same, but it came out damn close. <clears throat> maybe, maybe, maybe. Now real quick, real quick, if I would have forgotten, forgotten, to change this, what would the z-score have been if I would have left this as six? Somebody help me out. Negative 0.54, 0.53, 0.54, 0.53. If you look that z-score up, you get an area of 0.2981. Is that close to what it's supposed to be? 
It's freaking 10% off, right? That's no, no, that's, that's bad. It's no good. You kind of with me? So doing this, it, it makes sense in two ways. I'm hoping I can't use Z-score stuff that comes from a continuous curve. I can't use it directly on a discrete distribution. I can't do that. But by doing something so stupid simple, I mean, this is crazy. We just did this just so there wouldn't be gaps between our rectangles earlier. And now we find out that it's actually a really deep part of this theory. It's kick ass. By just doing this simple thing, this simple little correction, it makes the whole thing work. It's approximation. So I'm not going to give the exact right answer. But that's fine. Right? We're okay with that. Maybe, maybe, maybe. So let me give an example of a problem. We'll do it uh, fresh. Uh, and an example problem that shows you why the hell we want to know how to do this. Yeah. Why do we get the one plus Say again. That was the square root of NPQ. How did we get that last time up here? Yeah. So that's just from the binomial stuff from the beginning. Yeah. So I don't know if you guys remember this, but I was trying to remember when I was having trouble figuring out exactly how many coins, how many times I should flip something, the, the calculator kept overflowing. You remember that? It was awesome watching me do that. I know. I'm sure I'll do it again at some point. Um, so if you flip a coin 800 times, the calculator's going to freak out about that. And I want to know the probability that I get uh, more than 807 heads. So two things. The calculator would blow up. Is everybody with me? Some of you guys look confused. What's up? Is everything all right? What's up? So it's more of you. Is everything okay? If you flip a coin 800 times, it's probably going to get, oh, yeah, there, there it is. It'll take me a second. Go ahead and just tell me. It's all right. I was like, I must have done something like that. Your, your looks were like, should I tell him? <laughs> am, I, am I wrong? <laughs> no, if you do that, let me know again. So, and again, how many would you expect to get? Somewhere close to 400, uh, half of 800, because that's what 50% really means in this case is half of a really big number of trials should be heads, because that's the probability. Okay, so that doesn't seem very far away, but we're going to find out right now if it actually is or not. We're going to see if this is unusual. Um, calculator would blow up. We already tried it once, right? It, it blew up. Right? Uh, you want to do this using the formula. Do you understand what would happen with the formula? More than 407 means it could be, what could it be? More than 407. So you could get 408 or 409 or up to 800. That You have to do a formula for each one of those. You want to do that? No. Good. If you shook your head yes. I'd be worried. I'd be, actually, I'd want to talk to you. <laughs> to see. What else do you do in your life? Um, so the beautiful thing here is I can use the normal approximation. I can try to use the NAD. Because if I convert this into a z-score problem, z-score problems eat this kind of problem up for breakfast, right? This is exactly what they live for. They do it quick. I just look it up on the chart. I'm done. As compared to my calculator blowing up, or doing 400 calculations by hand, right? Screw up both of those, right? So can I use the nav? What do I have to check? Check what? To make sure I can use the nav. What tells me it's normal enough? What do I check? Our short-term memory is really, really bad. Yeah, and key has to be at least five. So if that's true, what the results tell you is it's normal enough to use the z-score chart. Okay, cool. So is this true? What's P and Q? Yeah, we're assuming this is a fair coin, right? It's not been weighted in some way. All right, cool. So P equals Q equals 0.5. What's the standard deviation? I mean, what's the mean? We already know the mean is. Yeah, 400. We knew that from the beginning, right? Don't even have to do the formula, but that's nice. The formula agrees with us. Half of 800 is 400. I expect that many heads. 
around there. Standard deviation is going to be what? How do I get the standard deviation? Binomial. You got to love binomial. What's the little? It's on that handout even. Yep, square root of NPQ. What do you guys get when you do that? Good, because you get like square root of 200, which would be 10 times root 2. So 14 point 1, 2. 1, 2. Who? Point 1, 4, 2. That's better. All right. So it kind of makes sense. If the whole point of the NAV is to use the z-score chart, in order to make z-scores, I have to know the mean and the standard deviation. Well, binomial ones are the best ones for that. I want to make a table. I don't have to do any of that weird shit. I just got these beautiful little formulas, right? That's so beautiful compared to what we did in chapter 3. x minus x bar, x minus x bar squared. You suck, Mr. Waller. I know somebody said that while they're doing that. That's fine. I live off that. It feeds my life energy. <laughs> All math teachers are like, that's why we get into the <clears throat> So now, I can draw the picture. I know it's normal enough to go ahead and draw it like a normal distribution. This is what I normally do when I do this. Uh, in the middle, of course, goes 400 to mean. I want 407. Draw a little box on 407. You don't have to draw boxes everywhere, because like you saw earlier, that gets disgustingly gross really quickly. Especially if you draw like me. The reason I draw a box only on 407 is what decision do I have to make now? Can I make a z-score yet? No, I don't know which number to use. I don't use 407 because that would be as if it was continuous. It's not. So I've got to use the continuity. This is the actual name of it. It's not something I made. It. Continuity correction, which we'll hear it for known, be known as CC. Continuity correction. So if I want, what did I say, more than 407, do I want to include 407? Are you sure? If you want more than 407, is 407 more than 407? So let me ask you again. Do you want to include 407? No, right? So I'm going to shade which direction? I'm going to shade up, right? More than. So if I'm going to shade up, do I want to start here or do I want to start there? Here or there? Here. Here, I like it, because I don't want to include the figure. Right? I want to give you A or B, and uh, here or there. And you're all like, how the hell are you talking? Here. Yes. I'm going to start here. I don't want to include the bar. Do you guys see how that's all? It takes like five seconds to just reason out. Do I start on the left side or do I start on the right side? That's all you got to do. You could try to memorize situations if you want to. That's a waste of freaking time. Just do this. I don't want to do this because and that would include 407. More than does not include 407, so I actually want to change it to 407.5. And then I can make a z-score out of it. Right? Then everything else is exactly the same as always. Make a z-score out of it, look it up in the chart, take one minus that because I want above. Oh crap. Six point seven something maybe. Point what is it? Point five three. Okay. Sounds about right. All right. Everybody agrees with you. And then and then we do it like we said. We look up point five three. Yeah, what do you get? 7019, so that's down here. So what's my? 
chance. Yeah, 0.2981. It's like almost a 30% chance. So is it unusual then? Would 407 be an unusually high number of hits? You can do it. What are you comparing it to? 5%. Thank you for those of you who are doing your homework. That has come up many, many times in the homework, so that should be like, oh, yes, I know 5%. <laughs> All right. How do you check this besides hope it's an odd problem? <laughs> How do you check this? It's, it's binomial at heart, right? So unfortunately, well, let's try it. I can't remember exactly the situation, but let's see if our calculators can handle this. Um, how would you put this into your calculator? What would you have to use? Binomial, which one? C or P? C. And you'd actually have to do from 0 up to 407 because the opposite of that would be uh, more than 407. So you'd do 1 minus uh, N, P, X would be 407. Let's see if your calculator blows up. Might. It's a very good chance it will. Do you have to know how to do binomial CDF and PDF? No. Part of me actually wishes you, you don't, <laughs> but I want you to know it's there. Anybody got that yet? No? Is it freaking out? I don't want to boot this computer, it takes forever. So we got that? No? Did you? No? Are you doing This guy? Okay. We do, yeah. oh, well, we're all going to be. Okay. All right. Who's anybody? Did it blow up? No. Oh, Oh, you didn't do the one minus though, right? So you got this. 7020? Alright, so we got somebody. Somebody did it. I got 7020 for this, which is basically freaking the same thing, right? So the calculator was okay with this one for some reason. It didn't blow up. So in some cases, you could check your work using binomial CDF. So that kind of, you can do that if you want to. Right. You can never do that as your work. Right. Don't ever write down for me. People always do. They just write me which buttons they pressed. <laughs> you will never get anywhere with me doing that. Right. I'll say, oh, congratulations, your calculator has passed the course. You must take it again. You calculate, yeah. Yes, I will be that dorky. All right, so how are we doing there? Is that decent? So we have central limit theorem. Central limit theorem is dealing with continuous data, a normal z-score problem. The only difference is they're taking a sample and asking about its mean. Oh shit, I gotta change the standard deviation. Then we have this. I have a binomial situation, flipping a coin, tossing a die, uh, and looking for fives and not fives. A any binomial situation, but I want to use a normal curve for it. This is the correction I've got to make. So let me ask you some quick fire questions on this. Um, let me show you an example. So if I said probability x greater equal to 11, the continuity correction would make this, all you got to do is put 11. Greater than or equal to 11 would say up, but do I want to include 11? Yes. So then I would start at 10.5. 
and then I'll make a z-score out of that. You guys see that? You guys understand? All right, so do these. Same way. Just tell me what the continuity correction would do. Just tell me what the continuity correction would be. That's all you can do, so do more of it. Chalkboards, you ever seen them? So I talk about E-track tapes almost, I think. I like your focus. much of you get it or you don't situation here. So let me see. So investigate this. I'll put 42 there, put a little box on it. Less than 42, do I want to include 42? And I want to shade down, so do I want to start lower or upper? Lower. There you go. Lower is upper. That's a better division. So then this would make this into probably x less than 41.5. I'm going to make a z-square out of that. Blah, 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 blah. Right. So what about this one? Draw a little thing. Put a little box on 114. Less than or equal to 114, do I want to include 114? Yes, so this time I want to start at the far wall, 114.5. That's what it's trying to be, yeah. Because I want to include, I'm going to shade down, right? And I want to include 114, which means include that bar, so I've got to start at the far wall so that I do include the bar. Do you guys see that? That's all there is to this, figuring out which way to go to adjust it. And we saw how much better the approximation gets when you make this adjustment. And then 201, do I include 201 greater than 201? No, and I want to shade up. So I don't want to include it, so I better start at this wall. So it'll be 201.5, kick ass. And you make a z-score out of that. Not too bad. But again, going forward, the thing we're going to use most often from that section is the check for normality. If I'm dealing with a binomial situation, how do I know it's normal? Shit. If I'm dealing with a binomial situation, NPQ, how do I know it's normal? NP and NQ have to be at least 5, greater than or equal to 5. Kick ass. That's your check for normality in that situation. Whoa! You guys are so hopeful I'm going to let you out. I'm not. Just to let you know. All right. So any questions over that? That's section 6-7. Six, 6-6, seven. Six, six, of course, is extra credit. So we have finished chapter 6. Holy shit. I can't stress to you enough how important chapter 6 is. If you're having any trouble with it, you have got to come see me. You've got to ask questions. Yeah. So the reason why we use um, CBS is because it was like we're trying to get to I want... All of this area, if I would have done PDF, it would have given me the area of this rectangle. Okay. And that's it. Yeah. The CC and the NAB are the same. Yes. Rectangle. The NAB uses the CC. Okay. All right. Okay. So we're going to get a little bit into chapter seven. I know you're all excited about it. And I'll, here we go.
And the thing I want you to realize, a huge part of chapter 7 we've already done. So what was the, uh, oh my gosh, pull a green dude. What was the formula we built off of this that we had to use when we had to go backwards? Remember, we had to find the top 5%. What was the formula we made that solved for x? What was that formula? Mm -hmm. This is why I shouldn't let you use any formula sheets. Just try to solve this in your head. Come on. Multiply it up, add it over. So x equals? No, that's true. Yeah, so two is, what's really good about what you just said, two is a specific z-score, right? So this thing, this idea of min and max, remember that you guys have used this, min and max. Negative two and positive two are the z-scores that tell you where unusual ends, unusual begins. So they, they, that's actually using this formula, putting a two and negative two there. Okay, I like it. I didn't expect a big reaction to that. All right, but that's a cool thing to realize that they are using this formula. Now, what is it that we normally don't know in statistics when we want to go analyze something? What do we not normally know? So to take a sample of people. I don't know the mean normal, right? Don't know the population mean. So instead of the mu, instead of mu here, what would I put? What, what, what do I use to approximate mu? What's the approximation for mu? What's the, that's the population mean, so what's the sample mean? X bar. X bar. Good God, guys. Did you all get together and just said, let's not say shit to him? <laughs> <laughs> or did you really, really honestly forget? Or, or am I that intimidating? I can't be intimidating. There's no way. So X bar. Right. Some of you guys are like, I don't know how to answer your question. That's all I want. What's the sample mean, X bar? I'm trying to show you, uh, and let me use this, let me use this. Let's kind of capture this in one statement. Um, this would be like plus or minus. So if I want to figure out, uh, and in fact, what would this really capture? How much data in a normal distribution, how much data would this capture? Say again. 95%, okay, good, 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 good. So if I had a normal distribution, I had the mean in the middle, if I go up two standard deviations, and I go down two standard deviations, that's gonna capture 95% of the information, right? So between those two, they capture 95%, roughly, of the information. Are we cool there? We said that before in many different ways, and there it is. So here's the beautiful thing. Uh, if I don't know the mean, but for the moment, let's say I somehow know the standard deviation. This is known. All right, let, me, let me talk about that for a second. All right, so normally I don't know either one. But if I know that the standard deviation of, of uh, lengths of bottlenose dolphins is something, and it's based on past research, people have done it forever, and I go to a specific little lagoon, and I'm worried that there's something wrong, there's like a runoff from some farm or something that I'm worried is stunting the growth of the bottleneck, of bottleneck dolphins that live there. Are you with me? Kind of with me. Shit, at least shake your head. So that you're not like holograms or some shit. <laughs> Somebody who's still teaching in an empty room. Um, all right, we start over. So I know from past research the standard deviation of lengths of bottlenose dolphins, right? I know it from past research. But there's a specific area where I don't know the average length, but people from there tell me, oh yeah, there's small dolphins down there. We're kind of worried about, is the water good? So I go there and I take a sample of dolphins. And I find an average, I find X bar. And, and why is that not good enough evidence on its own? So, so let's say that uh, the average uh, length of bottleneck dolphin, let's make something up, Jeff, because you don't know, uh, eight feet. Does anybody know offhand? Just in case, no, okay. You never know. Somebody might know. Let's see, the average length of a volume dolphin is eight feet. Uh, and I go down and take a sample of 30, one, and I get an average of 7.1. Let me stop there and let you digest what I just said, right? You get the situation? Why is that not even enough 
evidence on its own to go somewhere. Why might that not be enough evidence to say, oh shit, all the dolphins down there are in trouble? You can do it, you can do it. It's a sample. That's the number one problem with that being evidence by itself on the face of it. You can't just go, I got a sample that had smaller length, so therefore there's something wrong, let's go down there. And everybody else is like, dude, we don't even know if there's something wrong. So what I need to do, the fact, I really want you to understand this, uh, this by itself is not enough evidence to say that the whole population in that area is less than eight. Right? You, you with me? But eventually we're going to get to the point where we're going to say, is that far enough away from this? I've got to use standard deviation then to figure that out. But for right now, let's do this. Let's say, I want to figure out what's 95% uh, of the dolphins in that lagoon, what are their lengths between? So between what two lengths is that? And what I'm trying to get is a feel for what this might be. So chapter 7 is kind of a precursor to chapter 8 in that it, it gives us a way to maybe check some claims, but it's not really strong enough, but it's used all the time. It's an idea of confidence intervals. I like this idea of the dolphins because it feeds into the one way I look at this. Um, so if I take a sample... I don't have mu, I have x bar. But I go up and down two standard deviations from that. How much of the data have I caught? 95%, right? Assuming that x bar is the middle, and why do I do that? Because it's the best guess I have for what mu is, right? So I go out two standard deviations up and down. I've caught 95% of the data. So how confident am I that the real mean is in there somewhere, is in here? How confident am I that the real mean is in there if I've caught 95% of all the information? I'm 95% confident exactly, right? So what I'm trying to do is I go into a situation, I don't know what the real mean is. I take a sample mean, which I can bet money that's not going to be the real mean, but it should be close if I took a random sample. And then I make this little confidence interval. I go up and down so many steps. And I'll say, I am 95% confident that the real average length of dolphins in that lagoon is between something and something. And that's below eight. And like, oh, shit, that's evidence. That is evidence that we have to go down there and see. So let's try to, let me, let, let's make this a little more um, concrete here in a second. So, so the problem with this direct approach is there's one part of my equation that's kind of wrong. Where did this come from? What is that? Sample. sample means shit, which means I took a sample, which means what has to happen? I took a sample, and I'm talking about the averages of that sample. Therefore, what must change? Standard deviation, right? So this is still, the thing I love is this formula is the same damn formula, and this was what we used in the past. Why didn't we have to do anything weird with this? Because we were talking about individuals back then. But now that we're talking about groups, because that's how we got a sample mean, we took a group. I now have to use that standard deviation instead. I have to use a standard deviation that's good for groups of size n, not the standard deviation that's good for individuals, right? It's the same, I really desperately want you to use, it's the same damn formula. I don't know that, shit, use the best thing you got. I can't use that then, oh shit, well then use what you gotta use, right? Same damn formula. Let's make up some more numbers over here and make this more specific. So uh, I go down and I take a sample. What did I say? I forget what I said. Of who did I say? Doesn't really matter. So uh, let's say, uh, oh yeah, I said 31 dolphins from this little area. All right. You with me? Take a sample of 31 dolphins. Why do I say 31? Just to be sure that you can say what. Yeah, it's normal enough, right? Z-scores and probabilities do not match unless it is normal enough. So I can never do this kind of thing. I can never match up 95% with a Z-score unless it's normal enough. Sample of 31 dolphins. Uh, we find the mean, the sample mean was, what is it, 7.1. And I'll say the standard deviation I know for all dolphins across the world is known to be uh, 
uh, 1.68. Right, how are we doing so far? Is that cool so far? All right. Very hopeful am I. So, create a 95% confidence interval. CI is what confidence interval is going to be known as. The less writing I do, the better. I think we all agree with that. Create a 95% confidence interval for the true mean length of dolphins in this area. Now, the first thing you're going to love is we've got to become a lot more specific about the number two. And I don't mean make it 2.0000. I mean the number two is actually not the right number. It was an approximation from the empirical rule. Right. We have a much stronger device to use now. Somebody help me out here. If I draw a normal curve, and again, why do I know it's normal curve? Because it's enough. N is at least 30. Check. Cool. Why do I not have to do N, P, and N, Q? Really good answer to that would be there's no freaking P. Right? That's a really good reason not to do that because it's not that kind of problem. It's not an NPQ problem. It's not. So why would I do that? So I know it's normal because it's normal enough because the sample size is big enough. Uh, I want to take my mean I found, x bar, and I want to go up and down two steps. Not two steps, sir. Up and down enough steps to capture 95% of the data. So I need to find out, it's not quite two, it's something, it's something close to two. So I want to go up and down the same number of steps, so up Z and down Z. Can somebody help me figure out how to figure out what those Z scores are? And how to figure out how to use less of the phrase figure out? Makes sense. Why can't I not use this? That's 0.95, right? Why can't I not just look up 0.95 in the chart? What's the only areas the chart understands? Areas that are where to a z-score? Below a z-score. So if I wanted to know what this z-score was, I totally could figure that out. And if I know that z-score, I know that z-score because it's the same damn thing with a negative sign. Take it off. Because you go up and down the same amount. So how do I figure out that z-score? Well, how much is below here? Two and a half percent. Good. So 0 0.025, right? Look up 0 0.025 in your z-score chart in the right place. That's not a z-score, is it? It's up there. We don't know what the hell a z-score is. Can you find an area of 0 0.025 or close to it? Actually, you should find it exactly, I think. Nope. Uh, there it is. 0 0.025, right? Two and a half percent, not twenty-five percent. Good. Negative one point nine six, which I would round to two if I was trying to make a general theorem, which.